Welcome to Friday. Heavy, your guide to aggressive, abrasive, loud music, 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 brought to you by the folks behind Tune Dig. I'm Cliff. And I am Kyle. Thank you, Kyle. Each episode, <laughs> we cover. <laughs> no, no, let me, I'll take okay. this. <laughs> Thanks very much. I'll tell the people. Each episode, we cover three things. Thanks for joining us for one or more of them. First thing, one brand new release in the world of heavy and or weird music, and more importantly, why we think it'll be worth a spin. Secondly, one playlist we've curated to help you explore a heavy subgenre or artist or scene, often related to the new release in some way, if we can help it. And thirdly, and most importantly by far, one organization tackling a heavy issue by doing critical culture impacting work in their community. Because we punk rockers are all we got in this crazy world. Another good one today, Cliff. Let's get into it. What's the featured release of the week? We are excited to talk about Weird Ass Atlanta post Mathcore something. Uh, that has <laughs> made me feel like the Blood Brothers ate Mr. Bungle and are now individually projectile vomiting chunks of song in my direction. And that sentence describes a thing. That I like very much. I love a good persona of all the like bad ways you can write about music. I love a personification. Like if this were an animal that ate a vegetable in the produce section of a Publix in a suburban neighborhood, it would sound like this. It's your fault that I talk this way. The Benford Tools Chainsaw PX5000. Yeah, it's your fault because you're always like, well, if these two hardcore albums were bananas, what type of bananas would they be? I'm like, I I'm sorry. <laughs> I just, I have an overactive brain and I drank too much in my 20s. Uh, I mean, hopefully it makes for good podcasting. I don't know. It makes me think of weird stuff in really weird ways that are a lot more fun than trying to objectively describe what this sounds like. I'm always trying to make two synapses bump into each other at my brain party in a way that they wouldn't have naturally. It works sometimes. At any rate, as our neurons bump, we come up against the callous Dowboys dropping celebrity therapist via Monarch Heavy Records. And from what we have heard of the single so far and what we know about this crew, we're in for a fucking ride. I'm really pumped about being able to bring not only Atlanta, but just the weirdness and the earnestness with which weirdness gets approached by bands like this. The, the, the divergent sections of this band, the first time I listened to these singles, I was like, Jesus, this is so cliff. Yep. Yes, I really love it. So like probably other heavy nerds, I was kind of reminded that this band rips when they dropped to Die on Mars in 2019. Although, frankly, listening back a little bit further on occasion, I should have been paying attention before that because they were they were pretty on this track already and they've always been having fun. And on top of it, one thing that's always going to engender me to you, is that the right phrase, is releasing an instrumental in, 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 deer? in deer. Maybe that's it. Yeah, whatever. I'm going to like your band if you release an instrumental version of your record. Okay. I like that's the best. That's the best. File under the latest entry in Cliff Hates Lyrics and Vocals. In the long history of this, we need to do a Cliff Hates Vocals supercut between two and Friday Heavy. To be very fair about that point, this band in particular is one of the few that pushes back on that for me, right? But it's because he's mm -hmm. going so hard all of the time, right? Mm -hmm. I expect unacceptable levels of energy from frontmen. That's that's pretty much why I, I don't dig vocals. But on top of that record being great uh, that they released an instrumental version at all, when they released it in 2020, they did so to support the Atlanta Solidarity Fund uh, right after a bunch of Atlanta cops started throwing people in jail for protesting on the sidewalk. So I wish all bands did both of the things that we're calling out that they did. That was awesome about that. But either way, especially with this new record, I feel like, um, Kyle, we talk lovingly about our dads and the way that they introduced us to music. I feel like so mm -hmm. much was like, this thing you're letting me listen to today reminds me of Kansas. This sounds like Edgar Winter Group <laughs> over and over, right? And so like our dads before us, uh, as soon as I started hearing this record, I was like, oh, this is this is our damage by Fear Before the March of Flames. This is my favorite record in high school. And this is being like aggressively stop start. Like I'm going to genre shift now, just now. You're in an, an elevator. Now you're not. Like the aggressive and confusing. MC Escher core. Yeah. 
I, yeah. <laughs> So I love that kind of stuff. And on top of it, I do think it draws from like the what eventually got called like white belt hardcore and scream of the early 2000s. I mentioned Blood Brothers, but the kind of energy from like plot to blow up the Eiffel Tower and other bands like that and the way that some of that music uh, started eventually evolving into just kind of chaotic grind with experimental interludes. I mean, it almost came to the point that it, it these records were like hip-hop records with really odd skits in between songs. And so I love all of this stuff. And on top of it at this point, I think any band... Pl- I've, ne- I've never thought until just now how Dillinger is like Dilla. That's an interesting thought. In what way? The collaging and the and the collision or the way that callous Dowboys are, are maybe like old ludicrous. Not ludicrous. <laughs> But like the first Ludacris record yeah. where it's, okay, here's 28 bars and now here's a skit about being at a gas station. <laughs> yeah, I think any band anywhere near any of these spaces are knowingly carrying the Dillinger escape plan torch for sure. And I, I do feel like I hear a lot of the vocal styling, production techniques they developed, all that stuff. So actually speaking of that, that's a good tee up. The first single that we're going to play, the it's called What is Delicious? Who Swarms? And like speaking of Dillinger, like this. What is delicious? Question mark. Who swarms? Question mark. I'm Ron Burgundy. You're going to get plenty of Miss Machine vibes off of this song. Speaking of. Okay, now, if you are one of the subsets of dorks, probably like me, and you heard the end of that clip, and it had a little bit of, like, melodic singing to it, and you're like, oh, God, no. No, 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 I can't. Not with another deathcore-ish band that does this. Okay, I just want to come right out. This is not that. They do an extremely good job of pretty much never doing the same thing more than about 30 seconds at a time. But on top of that, I'll be the first to say that I think the melodic bits are super interesting the way they do on these singles, at least that we've heard. But let's go harder. So here's another single called A Brief Article Regarding Time Loops. And if you could get the sound of my neurons firing when something, I don't know, positive happens, I think it would sound like this. If you could James Webb telescope the inside of Cliff's brain. You're looking back 110 billion years. Check out Celebrity Therapist out today on Monarch Heavy. Go listen to it however you want. And then, as always, cannot emphasize or underline enough, please send this band your money through shows, through merch, and or through a direct donation. Hey, Callous Dowboys, what is your Venmo? Yeah, I did want to make sure we said Callous Dowboys again because I realized we talked about them a lot and didn't really say their name again. Go find them and give them money. Uh, They have a purple band shirt that I think is great. Slowly, I'm going to evolve this podcast into an update of band merch every two weeks. You're going to be like the Yankee Candle Kid, but like Cliff reviews his merch haul. Cliff unboxing from Shirt Killer. I I love this idea. And that... um, Disappoints that's me. The tu- that's the Tune Dig TikTok's first, <laughs> first content series. I'm so disappointed in myself. <laughs> so, speaking of, Callous Dowboys inspired kind of a different approach than usual for the playlist this week. It went a lot wider than deep, and I'm really stoked about how it turned out. So tell me about it. So, at the risk of trying to make a Cliff's burnt CD in his truck in high school 
genre mix or trying to avoid trafficking the same recommendations over and over again of bands that we have loved for a long time. Like we can only tell you about the chariot so many times, you know, Uh, we thought rather than like talking about genre or sound, we would celebrate the context that could even give rise to a band like Callous Dow Boys. And that is the the wildly eclectic and deeply underappreciated heavy and alternative music scene in Atlanta. And, and I think even underappreciated by you and me, like based on the conversations that we've had. We didn't know really how good we'd managed to have it over the past 15 years or so. So a couple of caveats. This is not the tourist trap ATL playlist. So no Mastodon, no Deer Hunter, no Royal Thunder, nobody that's like gotten big or gotten nominated for a Grammy or actually made money and shit out there in the world. And it also totally routes around the massive pileup of Atlanta-based lighter fare, the indie alternative Faye Webster. Oh, like there's so much stuff that's being made that's great, but this is not that. We wanted to traffic the weird, aggressive, like the counterculture in Atlanta has lots of weird underground tentacles and they're all strange and not all of them are great, but they're all interesting. So even as avid participants in our local music scene for the past 15, almost 20 years at this point, which is a staggering thought, I and I think we have failed to appreciate how consistent and diverse the weirdo music pipeline has been in in our hometown. Um, Bands and scenes have always seemed like flukes. You know, they, they survive in spite of outrageous obstacles and often, unfortunately, they vanish as quickly as as they pop up as scenes like get gentrified or people move out of town or or whatever it it, like never feels like it gets built up in a systemic we'll get into the dark side of that sort of like community-based stuff in the next section but I, i think the point is that life happens at a scale you can see and touch it's weird that we preoccupy ourselves politically and culturally beyond looking beyond that so much so all that to say this is a love letter to the sounds that have shaped us in more ways than we realize and frankly we have taken for granted a bit i think our hope is that we it encourages you to plug back in on the state of the scene around you Um, not by being an active participant like you please don't come out of pit retirement if your knees don't work so good and don't feel compelled to like chase what's cool again now your time was your time and that's great uh, you can be crystallized in amber forever. If, you, if you're not still an active participant now, you're either a lifer or you aren't. And if you have to ask, you're not. But by finding ways to like godfather the scene, like create actual physical spaces so that the next you and me and Cliff have places and people in a community that give them permission to discover their full, radical, wonderful weirdness. That's why scenes like this are so great and important. So uh, we called this playlist Peach Scuzz. And it's got, it's got so many good bands in it. It's 60 songs and it's like mostly within the last 20 years. And it's so wildly different, like noise rock, hardcore, punk, post-punk, just like all manner of stuff. All people that we have seen with a high life or a PBR tall boy in hand at the Earl or 529 or Linny's or you know, we could just name spots all day. Last thing I want to say on it is that I'm actually pretty pleased with how much was available on streaming because I th- I thought it probably died with the CD case that got stolen out of my car in the Highlands. But it is missing some classics, like I want to shout out Act of Faith and Scavenger of Death and then also personal faves of our era, like very early Big Jesus, not Shoegaze Big Jesus, but Grunge Big Jesus. Uh, I tried to find a video of the house show in Grant Park where they played Nirvana's Breed and they kept slowing it down halftime over and over and over. And they sold weed brownies and mushroom chocolate <laughs> out of the kitchen. And I was like, is this what is this what a scene is? Like, is this a thing people do? And then the cops came and everybody had to split because it was just in a residential neighborhood. While it was flooding outside. It was flooding outside. And... Johnny Johnny Dang from O oh Brother was still in the band at that point, mm-hmm. I think. So O oh Brother, another band, not included because they actually like have been on terrestrial radio. So that you know, they're too big to fail. So early Big Jesus, Artemis Pile Driver, which is still one of my favorite band names of all time. Bigfoot, Vegan Coke, who used to play at the Big House, ask us about the Big House on Ponce and our hippie friends <laughs> that used to live there. And Killing Floor. I feel very, very fortunate that there are like 50, 60 plus bands that we got to see and hang out with and have beers with and 
not everybody is fortunate enough to have that. But if you, if you were ever part of a scene ever, and you're in your thirties or forties or fifties now, think about maybe creating a DIY space so that the kids can get loud and be weird and take good care of each other and figure out who they are and how to make the world a better place. It's going to be so truly interesting to see what the modern equivalent of those scenes you're talking about become and what all of it means. Everything's so different now, which is a thing I used to think didn't make a lot of sense when people said it. But I don't know if our experience is actually different and pandemics really do shift everything in people's lifetimes like this. But like, <laughs> it's I don't know. It's wild. I think about it a lot. Because I'm I'm yeah. back to going to shows and I'm personally I'm masked up and all that stuff, but everyone's approach is different. The feel is different, and I, I think a lot about what you just brought up. What's that going to mean? And is someone else going to have the opportunity to have what we discovered in that something that gave us a place and a a thing to think about that was different than just where we were growing up? Yeah, I think the the takeaway is is if it's ever mattered to you and it made a difference in your young life and helped you become who you are, then then find a way to pay that forward now that you are more able. Yeah. Speaking of building communities and taking care of each other, uh, one thing we like to do in every episode is point out uh, an organization who's making a difference for the people around them. In order to do that, uh, we have to talk about shit. That's not fun. So... <laughs> Let's hit this round this week. And what's always fun about this moment, I feel like, is because if everyone stops and thinks, hmm, what are we going to have to talk about this week? Your brain explodes into 50 possible options that all come to mind very quickly. And that is just a terrifying place to exist inside of. Um, that said, let's talk about water. Because in the case that you might think that what happened in Flint, Michigan, and their drinking water became some sort of a fluke, some sort of thing that actually happened by accident. We want to help you better understand that situations like that are the civil form of war crimes <laughs> by a government on its own people. It's always, 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 always a policy choice to result in something that fundamental being lost. So this week, as of right now, as far as I know, at the moment that we're recording this, it continues in indefinite, but 180,000 people or so in Jackson, Mississippi, are without safe water for an unknown period of school has been canceled. Like kids can't drink water. People are in real danger. Uh, I don't know if you've been the South ever. It's hot right now. It just became September, okay? It is just now considering thinking about becoming a different temperature than hot ass summer. Okay, it is a, <laughs> it's a terrible time to be without water. Jackson, Mississippi is the capital of the entire ass state. Okay, they do, it's the most populous city in the state. They don't have safe water. And it is related that Jackson is over 80% black in a state run by a white Republican governor who has systemically and repeatedly ignored calls to fix Jackson's water issues, including the state leadership over and over. As Atlantans, we are familiar with this idea of city versus state, but in Mississippi, it is on a different level entirely, okay? We've got literally water infrastructure crumbling, the state having the ability to fix it and not, and not in not doing it, okay? Uh, and this isn't the first time this has happened for the residents of Jackson. They've been regularly under water boil advisories, going a month without clean water earlier this year, okay? As the residents of Jackson navigate this general affront to their existence, they need help getting clean water right now, okay? Policy decisions around infrastructure are, yeah, like a five alarm fire, right? People need to get voted out and new people need to get voted in, all of that. None of that's going to get safe water for babies to bathe in today or for children or the elderly to drink while it's really hot outside or for people to brush their teeth or anything. Okay, so what we want to bring your attention to is called the Mississippi Rapid Response Coalition. They have a water fund they've, that they've set up that's already been set up since earlier this year when Jackson previously lost his access to clean water. Just Google it. It's I, We've kind of confirmed it's the main place that's being pointed to, whether it's 
online or in articles or on Twitter or whatever. That's usually a good place that we check in to make sure we're listening to the community all around. This is a good place to go. So you can literally just Google, because there's not a great URL, Mississippi Rapid Response Coalition Water Fund. That fund has, uh, it's a coalition of over 30 organizations in partnership with the city of Jackson. They're providing water relief to reduce harm until that infrastructure can be repaired or improved. And because we always want to know what an organization is is backed by and how you can know that you trust it, uh, we'll call out that this coalition of organizations is backed in part by the People's Advocacy Institute, which is itself a nonprofit community incubator for transformative justice in the American South. So we've got a lot of people working together to try to make this thing better for people on the ground. And in times that can feel apocalyptic, these organization, organizations and coalitions like this one are often literally the only ones filling in the gaps in the land of personal responsibility and rugged individualism, fill in the gaps between inhumane living conditions and state governments that frankly intentionally keep them that way because they're busy spending money on people who don't need money. These organizations and coalitions desperately need your support. So like Cliff mentioned, there's no easy URL to say out loud for donations. So you can check our social media accounts when this episode goes live, uh, where we will share the direct link. Or you can Google Mississippi Rapid Response Coalition Water Fund. The official donation form is an Act Blue fundraiser page. Just it's letting something. people know they're in the right place for sure. Yeah. At the risk of, you know, being one of those blissfully naive, all caps, vote neoliberal people. You know, voting is at the bottom of the Maslow's hierarchy of a more perfect union. So so don't skip the step of voting in your next local and state election because that's where every vote actually counts and who's in the seat actually directly impacts the daily quality of life for your neighbors and you. Like Cliff mentioned, it doesn't get the babies bathed today and the elderly hydrated, but it is a longer term fix and something that we'd be remiss if we didn't tend to as well. And, you know, for sure, do whatever you can to at least help avoid the election of a governor who doesn't have a problem performing a slow rolling genocide on his own capital city in the cold light of day. Those assholes have no part. They, they have no right to be in places of public service. Nope. And you got to see it for what it is and you got to do both. You got to support the community and you got to do your voting, our own version of it in Atlanta. Uh, they just announced this week that Atlanta Medical Center is closing. That's literally my hospital. It's closing because Brian Kemp won't expand to Medicaid, which is free money from the federal government. The, it, it, it's people's lives. The stuff matters. Do what you can. Make a donation. Pay attention. And do your part as best you can to, to build those communities. This has been Friday Heavy. We'll be back in two weeks. Go to Toondig.com or follow us on Instagram and Twitter for links to the new release, the playlist, and the organization that we talked about today.